married, you inherit the other person's stuff. It's an automatic inheritance. Should be. Now we have prenuptial agreements and everything else because we're so selfish we don't want to trust the other person. I, oh, I trust you to marry you. I trust you to have kids with you, but I don't trust you with my money. What? That's the nuttiest thing I've ever heard in my life. And people do it all the time. No, it's an inheritance. I give you all I am, you give me all you are, and here we go. That's it. Look, Jesus says when the Son of Man comes with his entourage, it's going to be his angels. This narrator is like an angel, which we'll see in a minute, looking from heaven, calling out and saying, it's time. They're coming. Look at what's happening. We're supposed to be the ones like this narrator that are declaring that to the world. We're supposed to be declaring to people that there's going to come a time when God separates those who know him from those who don't. He will curse those who don't know him to eternal damnation because they don't have a relationship with him. And he will give eternal life to those who do. I didn't say that. Jesus did. It's a beautiful picture. And God and Christ... All that God does is he's trying to get us to see how beautiful it is when we surrender to him, when we become his, and how ugly we are when we try to be our own, have our own identity apart from him, and how ugly it makes the world when we don't surrender to his way and his coming. That's exactly what he's laying out. It goes on, it says this, all of them are skilled with swords and trained in warfare, Each has his sword at his side to guard against the terror of the night. There's this sense of, I thought we were doing wedding stuff, and these guys are to the hilt, weaponized. Why? Because there's going to be a battle someday to get the bride. Jesus tells us he's going to come back and he's going to deliver his bride, and when he comes with his angels, he's going to come and there's going to be a battle. This is such a beautiful picture of saying the king's on his throne. He he trusts his warriors. He knows they will be obedient. The angels are going to obey him. They're going to pour out the bowls of judgment when you read Revelation. It's going to happen. Solomon's written thousands of years before the New Testament. And there are these imageries that are just so perfect. I mean, a minute ago, we were just talking about frankincense and myrrh. Two things that were brought to Jesus at his birth. We'll see in a minute, Solomon is sitting in a gold chair. Gold was brought to Jesus at his birth. It goes on and it says, for the word, and in Hebrews it says this about the word, the sword. It says, for the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword. Remember, they're traveling with swords, but those swords we learn in Scripture are not swords that that cut. It's the sword of the Spirit. It goes on and it says, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It is able to judge the ideas and thoughts of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. You see, there's coming a day when he's going to come and we're going to have to give an account. And for those of us who know him, the account's going to be pretty simple. We're going to say, we're not beautiful like the Shulamite woman. We, We... We're not beautiful. We don't really have, you're the king and you have everything. I don't have anything to offer you. I haven't, remember what she said, I haven't taken care of my vineyard. I, I haven't done, but, but I believe in you. I love you. I, I care for you. I, I want you to be exalted and I'm going to surrender myself to you. And that's the thought when it's cut down that we place our account on the king, that I just give you my account. I place my account on you. I'm not trying to build up good works to build up an account so that I can look at you someday and see, say, that's why you should marry me because I'm awesome. No, that's not how it works. It's a free gift given. And Christ paid the price for us because he laid down his life to pay the debt of judgment, which he says right here, that we owe. And then he asks us, you ready for this? To pick up our cross and follow him. You know, it's interesting. I was speaking at a men's addiction ministry this week. And I was speaking through um, the idea of picking up your cross and surrendering to Christ. And one of the things I said to the guys that one of them was kind of impacted by 
was I said, you know, we look at picking up our cross, and unfortunately we framed it in a framework that's just not biblical. We look at picking up our cross as this idea that I'm picking up my cross to follow Jesus so that I can get to heaven. I, I pick up my cross each day so, I, so I'm better, so Jesus loves me more. So that's, that's why I pick up my cross, is, is so I can get in good with him. We pick up our cross for the same reason Jesus picked up his. Jesus didn't doubt the love of his father, so he picked up his cross. Jesus wasn't trying to earn his way to heaven. He owned heaven. Jesus picked up his cross for you and I. The reason that we pick up our cross in this life and we bear our cross is not for ourselves. It's for the bride of Christ. It's for those that need to see Christ again. And Jesus says, I want to show myself and who I am through you the same way when I came, I showed people who I was through me. And we twist that. And we make this pick up our cross thing, this like I'm a martyr and I sacrifice and oh, it's so hard. It's like, I pick up my cross because I got an inheritance. I pick up my cross because I know that my account has been put on him and I'm not afraid. I pick up my cross so others can see that it's worth it to live for him, to die to myself, to give up my rights and to say we're married now, we're one. I give my rights away. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture that we see in the scriptures. Jeremiah says this about the heart. He says, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? The answer is no one except I, Yahweh. Examine the mind. I test the heart to give each according to his way and according to what his actions deserve. And you say, yeah, but Matt, you just said that we don't pick up our cross and take all those actions so that we can get to heaven, but God's going to judge us for our actions. Let me ask you, have you taken the action of being married to Christ? Have you taken the action of repentance? Have you taken the action to surrender yourself, your heart, your mind, and say they're yours now, God? Does it show up in your life because you pick up the Bible and want to know it because I just want to know all the inheritance. I want to know who he is. I want to know what the world's like. I want to know what to expect. Is that it or have you been deceived? You know, this week there was a prominent Christian author, apologist, who who it came out this week did absolutely atrocious, awful, horrible wicked things awful and it's amazing now that we're reading articles and people are coming out and saying oh well there was a sign yeah there was a sign oh there was that highly intelligent man highly gifted but one of the things I read in one of the articles that I thought was really interesting is this guy said you know one of the things that that we stopped doing is we stopped preaching the simplicity of the cross. That the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And we move to this like intellectual Christianity, this I've got to earn my rights, I've got to have all these ideas versus this simple childlike faith. Listen, I love studying the scriptures. I love knowing the scriptures because it shows me my God. It doesn't give me better arguments for the world. My message to the world is not, here's all my arguments, here's how you can have a good life. My message to the world is, you need to pick up the cross. You need to take the cross, you need to give up your life and surrender to Christ. That's a message that anybody can hear. Doesn't matter how smart they are, doesn't matter how young they are, how old they are. It's a matter of, will I surrender And Jeremiah says the heart is so wicked, it twists things. You can be twisted up. It is so easy. And this couple in Song of Solomon is trying not to get twisted up. They're trying to do things the right way. And when it does get twisted, when you've been twisted, guess what? We put it on Christ's account. We look at the cross and say, man, I am twisted up. I am messed up. And we repent and we confess. We ask for help. We ask for the body of Christ to help us. And Jesus is in heaven saying, it's canceled. The debt's canceled. I love you. Now show what it looks like to live as a person who loves me. He goes on and says this. The narrator says, King Solomon made a sedan chair for himself with wood from Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold. 
and its seat of purple. Its interior is inlaid with love. Some translations say leather. The reason for that word and that terminology is it's a covering. It's a skin covering. When Adam and Eve died, God gave, or when Adam and Eve sinned and he kicked them out of the garden, he killed an animal and covered them with it. Leather. He put skins on them, the Bible says. That's a representation of this. And then it goes on and it says, with the love by the young women of Jerusalem, come out, young women of Zion, and gaze at King Solomon, wearing the crown his mother placed on him the day of his wedding, the day of his heart's rejoicing. Solomon is saying, I have been waiting for for this day, like I, I am rejoicing that I'm going to get my bride. Like Solomon himself is waiting and now that people know he's been waiting and they see it happening, there's this celebration. He's prepared a chair, he's prepared a sedan chair. To, his bride's gonna come into the, they're gonna walk together. They're gonna be carried together. I mean, this is beautiful. There's this love and compassion, and the Bible tells us that Christ will reign on his throne. It says that Solomon's going to come, get his bride, and in other places in the book, it talks about the fact that he's going to prepare the bride. When Paul was writing 2 Corinthians, he wrote this. He said, I wish you would put up with a little foolishness from me. That's a good verse for marriage. That's a really good verse for marriage. <laughs> I hope you'll put up with a little foolishness from me because I'm an idiot. Just saying. I got that Jeremiah heart sometimes. Jeremiah that we just read about, that heart that twists things. And typically we don't like to be untwisted. I don't know about you, but I don't know, I can't think of a time in my life where my wife has confronted me on something foolish and I responded to her by hugging her and thanking her and telling her how wonderful and glorious it was that she confronted me and that I'm being changed by Jesus. Later I might come back and say thank you. I've done that a few times. But most of the time I get real defensive. I start to twist things because I don't want to look foolish. But see, if you understand whose you are, if you understand that Jesus has paid the price like Paul did, you're not afraid to say, I'm foolishness, I have foolishness, and I need you to be patient with me like Christ is patient with me and like put up with it for a little bit. Like, I... You're not afraid of that. He goes on, he says, yes, do put up with me. Can you imagine? Put up with Paul? For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, Paul says, because I've promised you in marriage to one husband to prevent, prevent, ah, present, present a pure virgin to Christ. Paul's using the illustration of Song of Solomon. He's using the illustration of marriage. He's saying, my goal in planting these churches is that I want people that will surrender to God and that we can see Song of Solomon come alive in your life and in your life and in your life. And there's this picture of God is jealous. And the reason I'm jealous for people's hearts, the reason I'm jealous for them to walk with Christ is not because I want to be right. It's not because, oh, you better be good. It's just God's going to be mad at you if you mess up. It's because I know he's so jealous for me that he loves me. I want other people to experience that. That's what Paul's saying. And then he goes on and he says, and he wants to present us pure, virgins. That means unblemished. None of us are virgins. We're all sinful. You might have preserved your physical virginity, but you, in your heart, you have done sinful, wicked things. But Christ comes in and he says he's going to cleanse us. He's going to give us a new birth, a new life, a new... That's incredible. Then he goes on and he says, But I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced from a complete and pure devotion to the king, to Christ. It's hard to wait. It's hard to wait. Our hearts want what it wants right now. Our hearts will twist it so we can get what we want right now. And Paul's like, I just want you to see that it's worth it to be devoted to this one that's coming. It's worth it. Then he says, for if a person comes and preaches another Jesus, another king, another Yahweh saves, another husband whom we did not preach, or you receive a different spirit which you had not received, or a different gospel which you had not accepted, 
you put up with it splendidly. Paul's looking and he's writing to this Corinthian church and he's saying, I wish this was your heart. I wish you had the heart of these people in Song of Solomon, the narrator, the the woman, the daughters of Jerusalem. I wish you guys had this heart, but instead, you let people come in. You let the, remember last week we talked about the little foxes that come in and steal the vineyard, steal the grapes in the vineyard. You keep letting that come into your life and it's eating you alive. Don't do it. And you're going to need help. You're going to need God's help through the power of the Holy Spirit and his church to help you see these things because Paul is writing this to the churches to help them see how great it is to be devoted to the one who says he's devoted to you. Look at what it says. You ready for this? Because Paul's trying to say, look, I'm trying to show you that there's one so devoted to his glory, to his heavenly father, to their plan to raise up a nation, to raise up people for themselves. He, he, it's so beautiful to him. So right after we get done with this part of Song of Solomon where the narrator's talking about how the heart's rejoicing, right? The day of the heart's rejoicing, you would think Solomon would be like, oh, he's talking about me. I'm the king. I'm awesome. Look at my throne. Look at my entourage. I've prepared. I'm going to go get my bride. Everybody's going to be impressed by me. <laughs> They're going to look at me and be like, ooh, yeah, that's, look at This is beautiful because King Solomon throws all of the beauty back on his bride. Look at this. He says, how beautiful you are, my darling. How very beautiful. Behind your veil, your eyes are like doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Isn't that awesome? Just lean over and tell somebody that. Your hair hair is like a flock of goats, according to the Bible. Like, he goes on and he says, look at this. Streaming down from Mount Gilead, your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn sheep coming up from washing, being purified. Each one having its own, having a twin and not one teeth, tooth missing. I love that. Not one missing. Like, yeah, you got no missing teeth. That's, that's a good thing. Like, I think that's hilarious. Then it goes on, it says, your lips are like a scarlet cord and your mouth is lovely. Behind your veil, your brow is like a slice of pomegranate. I mean, she's got a veil on and he's looking through the veil and he's like, oh yeah. We still do this in our weddings today. Paul says that it's like we look in a veil, a mirror dimly, right? Right? And as we're looking through the veil dimly out, Jesus says, I see you behind there. I know what you've done. I know what you've prepared. I know what I've prepared you for. And you know what? You're beautiful to me. You're trying to cover up and it's, man, do I look good enough? Did I do my makeup? Is my hair in the right way? I don't know. I got all these women. They were messing with me before I got down the aisle. I hope it's okay. Ah, Right? Are they, is whoever lifts the veil, are they going to smooth it? Are they going to leave it all bunched up and back? I don't want them to do that. Like... And he looks and he's like, "Ah, don't worry about any of that. I just want to tell you how I see you. Do you realize that's what scripture is? It's God telling us how beautiful we are to him if we'll only surrender. He takes a cross and the beauty of the cross and he says, I do this so that you'll see the beauty of giving your life for others. Goes on and it says this Your neck is like the Tower of David, constructed in layers. A thousand buckles are hung on it, all of them shields of warriors. This guy's a warrior king, and he's like, Your neck's better than the warriors. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. Do you see what's happening right now? He's taking the look. You've seen the look, right? You women know this. You've seen the look. Guys, you don't really notice the look. But you women notice the look that guys give. When they start at your eyes, they start at your face, and they move down. Right? Very appropriate for a man to do that. I love during a wedding when the bride's coming down the aisle to always turn and look at the guy. I just always do that. I'm like, I can't see her anyway. She's behind a veil. So I I look at the guy, and it's always amazing to me. Like, his eyes are like, 
Oh, he's like a panicked doe in headlights. Like, <laughs> you know, he's just, he doesn't know what to do if he doesn't pass out, which I've seen before. And so here's this, it's the same thing. He looks and he says, twin, twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. He's like, wow, you're beautiful. This week, my wife sent this to me. I think I saw it last year, but I don't remember. But she sent this to me. I don't know if she's trying to tell me something, but she sent me these new sweet tarts. And it says, hey, tower neck. You know, instead of I love you, it says, your breasts are fawns, your teeth are sheep, and you have goat hair. So if you can find these little, you know, sweet tarts for Valentine's Day, you might want to give those to your, you know, spouse. I don't know. Anyway, so he goes on, he says, before the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will make my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Where's the myrrh and frankincense that she hangs? You are absolutely beautiful, my darling, with no imperfection in you. Do you remember how she talked about how imperfect she was? And how she didn't want him to look at her because of all the imperfections? And he's coming around and he's saying, "Uh uh-uh. I've made you perfect. If I'm coming to get you, you are my perfect bride, period. There's not another one. You're mine. And I'm not going to let you believe that garbage. I'm not going to let you believe that garbage. Now, does that mean life's just grand and beautiful and wonderful? No. Does it mean we don't talk about our imperfections because we're fallen people? No. But at this moment, when it's the king looking at his bride, and his bride has been very humble all along, she has contained her desires, she sees herself for who she really is, it's in this moment that the king comes alongside to encourage her and tell her how beautiful and lovely she is. And that this is the moment, and he's like, before the day's done, this wedding's over, we're consummating, and we're having a party. This is the Bible. The Bible writes this, and it's no different that Jesus says, I'm going to come, I'm going to get you, because you're my bride. Look at, he goes on to say, come with me from Lebanon, my bride, with me from Lebanon, descend from the peak of Amana, from the summit of Sanir and Hermon, from the dens of the lions, from the mountains of the leopards. You have captured my heart, sister, my bride. You captured my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful your love is, my sister, my bride. Your love is better than wine, and the fragrance of your perfume than balsam. Your lips drip sweet sweetness like honeycomb, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Why? Because he is the one who has changed us. In Isaiah, it said he gave, Isaiah, when he said, I am a man of unclean lips, God said, I will cleanse your lips so you can speak for me. This is, this is beautiful. He goes on and he says this in Ezekiel to Israel. It says, therefore I say to the house of Israel, this is what the Lord says. This is Ezekiel the prophet. It's not for your sake that I will act, house of Israel, but for my own holy name. Remember, when a bride marries a woman, she takes his name. It goes on and it says, which you profaned among the nations where you went. I will honor the holiness of my great name. And those who aren't looking to make a name for themselves but are surrendering to my name get what's going on here. And he says, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them, the nations will know that I am Yahweh. In other words, I'm the only being, the only God, the great I am, the declaration of the Lord God. When I demonstrate my holiness through you in their sight. God says, I want to demonstrate how I can cleanse and perfect and love a bride. I want to show the world what a surrendered person 
looks like. And then he goes on, for I will take you from the nations. Remember, he was just calling, come from Lebanon, come from Gilead, come from the mountains. He's telling them to come. He says, for I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I prepared a place for you. I'm going to bring you to it. And then he says, I will also sprinkle you clean, sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll remove your heart of stone. Jeremiah says, we have that heart of stone, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, a heart of flesh, one that's responsive, one that gives itself to the other person. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. He says, I'm going to change your heart and then I'm going to give you the power to be able to obey, to be able to pick up your cross so that you can declare to others that there is an amazing king, an amazing husband, an amazing man, an amazing warrior who is coming and you want to be with him. He goes on and says this in Song of Solomon, my sister, my bride, you are a locked garden. Remember how Paul was saying, you guys just let anything in? And he was frustrated in 1 Corinthians that we just read? No, 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 no. See, Solomon is looking now at his bride and he says, you're a locked garden. You have protected and saved yourself for me. You don't want things to get in that will contaminate you. You want to be ready for when I come. You want everyone to know that you're ready for me. You want everyone to know that I am yours. That is beautiful to me. And that's what God asks of us. He asks us to lock our hearts dead on, set on, on him. And then he says, your branches are a paradise of pomegranate with its choicest fruits, henna from nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the best spices. You are a garden spring, a well of flowing water streaming from Lebanon. It's this beautiful picture of him saying, look, I have prepared you for this. Someday we're going to get to heaven and there's going to be a stream going through heaven of living water that he's prepared for us. And all of these things are descriptions. They're, they're, um, the senses are going wild here. Because when Christ comes back someday, all the senses are going to go wild. Heaven's going to shake and quake. The angels are going to rejoice. The martyrs are going to cry out. It's going to be amazing. And he looks and he says, my bride I want you to know that you might feel like you're locked up. You might feel like, well, I don't have any fun, and this is so hard, and this is so difficult. Can I just tell you, wait, it's worth it. I'm coming. Can't you smell it? Can't you, don't you see it? He goes on and he says this. I have come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh with spices, I eat my honeycomb with my honey, and I drink my wine with my milk. And the narrator declares, in other words, the heaven declares at this moment, the narrators of heaven, the angels of heaven, the elders in heaven declare, eat, friends, drink, and be intoxicated with love. Wow. Wow. If that's not a picture of what's coming for us one day. That, that there's, there's a Savior who says, I'm preparing a place. We got kicked out of a garden. I've made another garden, and I'm going to bring you into it. I'm gathering everything together so that when you get here, it's ready for you. And there's going to come a day when we fellowship together. We eat together. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians as we wrap up and take communion. He says this, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. You see, we become one flesh with Christ by picking up our cross. We crucify the flesh, the Bible says, because we know that we get a different flesh. We know we're going to get a new body. So I'm not really that overly concerned about trying to make this body perfect doesn't mean I abuse it. It's the only one I got. I better use it wisely. But he says, this mystery is profound. Song of Solomon is a book that has been profoundly myster mysterious throughout the ages. Why? 
Because the mystery of how Christ and God and the Trinity uses marriage and the bride and puts this together and how he's established marriage between a male and a female to bring creation into being through them is amazing. It's profound. It's significant. And to mess with that makes God really upset because it's a reflection of who he is. And that's what Paul's saying here. And he says, to sum up each of you, is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Isn't that what we're called to do in a relationship with Christ? Each of you is to love his wife of himself, and we see Solomon saying, all I have is yours. Everything I've stored up, it's yours. You're my bride. I invite you in. And we see the bride surrendering, giving herself, Guys, this is the picture that is so unique to Christianity. (laughs) It's beautiful. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. The same temptations they're going through in Song of Solomon are the same ones we go through. It hasn't changed. We try to twist it to think it's not. It hasn't. And then he goes on. He says, God is faithful. You may not be faithful. You're going to mess up. You're going to get dirty. But God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you'll be able to bear it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I'm speaking as to wise people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we give thanks for, he's talking about communion, is not for sharing in the blood of Christ, Or is it not for sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all of us share in that one bread. That's a marriage. It's one union, male and female. And there's shedding of blood, there's the giving of DNA. Communion is that picture of us saying, I'm yours, and I'm waiting. Look at what Jesus said about this. In Luke, when he knew that his time had come, when he knew his father was calling him home, and his first coming was over, and now he was going to have to tell you, me, the disciples, to wait for his second coming. He's at the Passover meal with communion. Look at what he says. When the hour came, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him. And then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I'm going into battle and I wanted to eat one more meal with you all before I go into the battle. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. In other words, Christ himself is not eating and taking communion right now. He's not eating from the vine. Why? He gave it to us as a reminder so that we would remember when we take it that he's going to come back someday and he's going to sit down at the table with us and invite us in and he's going to supper with us, sup with us. He is going to tabernacle with us. He says, then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. That means his second coming. And then he took the bread and he gave thanks. Jesus is getting ready to endure the most horrific thing ever in the history of the world. The judgment of creation on himself and he's giving thanks. That he gets to give his life for his bride. No complaint. He's looking at his apostles and he's saying, I love you. I'm going to give my life for you. And we're going to give thanks for that. And he asks us to do the same. He asks us to be people who will find thanksgiving in giving ourselves versus trying to get. And he says, he broke the bread. He broke his body, gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't get it. By doing enough, he says, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, another cup, the cup of judgment. And and he says, this is the cup 
is the new covenant established by my blood. It's shed for you. I drank the cup of judgment. This is the cup of feasting and rejoicing. He's looking at them and he's saying, you can have confidence that I'm doing this because it's beautiful. Let me ask you, we're going to go into a time of communion. It's at the table. I'd ask you to kind of try to social distance as you go up to the tables. On there is a cup. It's got on the top a wafer. You just peel it back. And then the second layer is grape juice. If you need gluten-free, it's over here on the table. We have that available as well. Can I just tell you, when you take communion, it is a declaration of everything we just looked at in the scriptures. It is a declaration of what he's done for us, his love for us. And it's a small thing that we do in remembrance of what he's done. And we do it with joy. No matter what we're going through, we do it with thanksgiving. We confess like the Shulamite woman, this is me. I need your body. I need your blood. I need you. I I long for you. That's what we've been reading. That's communion. And when you do that, you're remembering that there's a king that says he's coming for us. And he tells us with this right here, and just like he did his disciples, eat my friends. Those of you who have surrendered to me and are my friends and my family because of the relationship that we have through Jesus Christ, inviting him to pay the payment for our sins, to take our judgment, and we say now we want to do what you did, so we pick up our cross because we're grateful for everything we have, not trying to get something, and we just want other people to know that. Now it's time. I can eat and drink and be intoxicated with that love. That's communion. So as we pray together, I would just ask you to check your heart. As Paul asked the people of his day to check their hearts. As Jeremiah said to check the heart. As Ezekiel said, God wants to give us a new heart. Check your heart. Pray. And as you take communion, I hope you can hear him say how beautiful you are. Not because you've earned it, because you don't deserve it, because how beautiful he is. And you have his name if you know him. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you for communion and the gift that it is to us. And Jesus, you left us with a communion that was a reflection of the Old Testament Passover where you delivered your people out of slavery. I know there may be people here listening or that are here in this room that feel just enslaved. Father, I pray that they would see that you want to cleanse them. You want to set them free to live for you. And then we willingly become your servants, your slaves, because we recognize that we have everything because we're yours. We, we carry your name. And that you're coming back someday. And, and you're going to finally get rid of this, this battle that we have within us. Lord, I pray that those listening would know that you say that if we know you, that we are beautiful to you. And that in that beauty, you'll come and you'll cleanse us. You'll clean us up. The only thing that can separate us from your love is us not embracing it. Because you're pouring it out. And so, Father, if there's anyone who hasn't asked you to come into their life to take the judgment they deserve and surrender to you and say I will be yours then I pray today would be the day and for those of us who know you I pray that we would delight in this communion because of your love Amen